I'm a cleft craniofacial. We just started. Okay, I'm a cleft and craniofacial orthodontist. And just so I have an idea of what everybody's awareness of what a craniofacial orthodontist is, if you could type in the chat, yes, I know what ortho, or just put yes, you know what it is, or no, you don't know what it is. Either way, we're going to go over it together, but it would be helpful to have an understanding of of what your familiarity is already with what it is. Let's see. Yes, no, no, don't know. Awesome. Well, no matter what camp you're in, you're in the right place. So perfect. So let's get started. So I'm a cleft and craniofacial orthodontist. It's very different uh, than being a traditional orthodontist, which you probably have experience with either personally as a patient or maybe it's a career you're thinking of trying on for size once you make it to dental school. I imagine everyone here is pre-dent and it's amazing how fast the time goes. So pretty soon you will not be a pre-dent anymore. You will be moving on to the next stage. So anyway, let's get started. If anybody wants to connect uh, following this, you're welcome to follow us on our Bite Size Instagram. So just scan this QR code. We review DMs also, so if you have questions following this, just send it Send it that way. That's always a nice way to stay in touch. All right. Let's see. Is it moving? There we go. So, oh, the places you'll go. It's my favorite quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes, but it's from Dr. Seuss. You can tell I work with kids, right, because I, I like Dr. Seuss. But anyway, so... I'm sure if you don't already have a slide that looks very similar to this, you will in the not too distant future. So when you get to where I am in my career, you've probably, or I've lived in a bunch of different places. I've gone to school. It seems like everywhere I've worked, it seems like everywhere. Um, so just to give you a little background about who I am, uh, I went to University of Kentucky for my undergrad I was not a science major. I understand that those are common questions that pre-dents have. I was a Spanish major, actually, and I had a br brief stint in fashion school studying shoe design. So um, we can talk about dental school admissions later on if you have questions about that. But common question I get is, do you have to study science or be a science major? The answer is no. Um, I went to UCLA for dental school. You'll see UCLA on here a few times, actually, but I did my orthodontic residency training at Baylor, which is now called De Texas A&M in Dallas. And then I became board certified uh, through the American Board of Orthodontics. I then moved back to Los Angeles and worked in private practice for a bit and taught at both UCLA and USC for a couple of years in their orthodontic department. And I really wanted to focus my clinical care and the rest of my career on cleft and craniofacial care. So at this time, I was an orthodontist and I wanted to become a cleft and craniofacial orthodontist. So I actually moved to Seattle and did a one-year fellowship in cleft and craniofacial care at Seattle Children's Hospital, which was my favorite year of my life. Um, I still tell people that, and I still believe that that's true. I loved it. It's probably an additional year beyond residency that you were not aware of exists, uh, but fellowships are becoming a lot more mainstream now to do, particularly if you plan to have cleft and craniofacial population be your predominant patient population. So we'll talk a little bit about that together today also. But after that time, uh, I moved back again to Los Angeles and became the team's cleft orthodontist at UCLA. And I worked at UCLA full time. Another hat that I wore while I was there was as pre-doctoral program director in orthodontics, which I loved that as well. It was a lot of fun to work with pre-dents, dental students, and residents. So I have a lot of experience in reviewing applications and personal statements and answering a lot of questions related to admissions. So I'd be happy to talk about that as well at some point if you have any questions, but it's all all so much fun and it's really given me an opportunity to have a very non-traditional career in dentistry and orthodontics. I then moved to Phoenix uh, for a hospital position at Phoenix Children's uh, and now I am leading Bite Size, which is an online education platform for dentists and pre-dental students, residents as well. 
And we focus on providing education for what we call the modern learner, which is we, when we have courses, they're in bites or 15 to 20 minute modules on niche, modern, very two days topics uh, in clinical care and business. And we also host monthly uh, free sessions with industry experts. So you're always welcome to tune into those. If you're interested, we send those links out through email. So you can just scan that QR code if you want to tune in sometime. And then it never hurts to keep looking for sunshine. Also a quote um, that I love, it's by Eeyore. And the reason I show you this slide is these are some of the projects that I've been fortunate to take part in. My publishing and research interests have been in cleft and craniofacial care, of course, but also in team care and education. So my point in showing you this is no matter what discipline you go into in dentistry, I think you have a really great opportunity to collaborate with other dentists, to collaborate with other institutions, as well as outside of dentistry. So I've been fortunate to do that. And I think also when you go into something like cleft and craniofacial care, where there's fewer providers in that overall, your knowledge base is a bit more sought out. So if you're interested in something like that, or you like to write, you like to research, you like to publish, you like to collaborate with other people and make it a really collaborative experience in your career, I think that this is a great way to go. All right, so what is craniofacial orthodontics? It's considered a subspecialty of orthodontics, at least within the provider population. It's, I put subspecialty in quotations because it's not that it's accredited per se as a subspecialty and officially recognized as a subspecialty of orthodontics. But uh, I think as we'll go, on, go over this together today, you'll see that it is very different than traditional orthodontics. So what makes us, quote, different from traditional orthodontists? There's a few things. So my patient population has been very specific to patients with clefts craniofacial conditions and syndromes, special needs, and medical complexities. Uh, so while you may have somewhat of an exposure to that in residency, you don't get a lot. Uh, but after a fellowship, you train in that extensively. Another difference between perhaps the care that I've provided versus what a traditional orthodontist does is I see infants. So you might be wondering, what could you possibly do with an infant or a newborn? They don't have teeth yet. Um, and if you're not aware, I'll tell you now that traditional orthodontists or orthodontists see um, patients typically starting around six or seven years of age. So if you don't have a cleft or a craniofacial condition, this is the general guidance given to people in the, pop in the public. The timing you need to go and see an orthodontist for your first exam is typically around age seven. But if you have a cleft or a craniofacial difference or a syndrome, special needs, any type of medical complexity, we might be seeing you earlier. So particularly when it comes to patients with clefts, and we'll go over what a cleft is in a couple of slides, we see them even within the first week of life because that's the time when I provide some of that care. And again, we'll go over that in a few, in a few minutes. We also see patients up to adulthood. Uh, commonly even the same patient from birth to adulthood because a lot of care is needed depending on the condition. Another difference is that we might have a hospital-based practice. So I've been fortunate to have my clinical expert or ex my clinical experience be in hospitals and universities as opposed to a brick and mortar private practice. Um, it is considered a private practice in that it's it's its own practice, but it's located within a hospital. So that's a very unusual way to practice orthodontics, but it truthfully is the only way I would wanna practice orthodontics. I loved uh, that clinical uh, component of my career. Now, working in an interdisciplinary cleft and craniofacial team is really the hallmark of this. So to give you an idea, the American Cleft Palate and Craniofacial Association or the ACPA, that approves clefts and cranio, cleft and craniofacial teams in the US says in order to be an approved team, you have to have an orthodontist as part of that team. So that just goes and tells you like how important it is to be an orthodontist and to be an orthodontist as part of a team. You're really, really uh, indispensable when it comes to the care of these patients. So an interdisciplinary cleft and craniofacial team is comprised of providers from medicine, dentistry, allied health, 
like speech pathology and psychology and audiology and the list goes on and on, social work. Uh, and we all create a team to care for these patients throughout the course of their lives. So you can see if you're familiar with traditional orthodontics or you've been to an orthodontic practice as a patient before, what I'm describing here for craniofacial orthodontics is a bit different. Additionally, the path to becoming a craniofacial orthodontist is, is somewhat different as well. I say plus minus fellowship training, as you saw before, I, I did fellowship training and it's becoming more and more the norm if you're gonna be spending time, uh, particularly in a hospital treating these patients, um, but it's not mandatory that you do a fellowship. Uh, you'll see as we go through this that you have limited exposure in residency if you go to orthodontic residency. So that's why it's that much more important to pursue a fellowship if you do plan to do this as your career. I would believe that by the time you make it to this stage, though, fellowships will probably be the norm and perhaps even the exclusive thing that you need to have if you plan to work on a cleft and craniofacial team. So just something to keep in mind. So there is an issue, though, in general traditional orthodontic training in that you might be exposed to cleft and craniofacial care, but time and time again, we see through studies that providers or orthodontists, as well as orthodontic residents, continuously report that they don't feel comfortable with the care of these patients. And it's not surprising. Uh, we don't have the time or the need really to go into why that's the case together today, but just recognize that it is uh, extensive knowledge to, to treat these patients well. Um, I do think it's important that this is that residents are exposed to this and I continue to advocate for it, but you also have to recognize that there's already so much to learn in the three years of orthodontic residency in traditional orthodontics that you can't expect to master all of this stuff simply in only residency. So uh, we have we still have some work to do in the curriculum, um, but I do think it it highlights the pressing need to do a fellowship if you do plan to treat a lot of these patients in your practice. So who's on a cleft and craniofacial team? This is a list of providers that you would find on a cleft and craniofacial team. And you see that it runs all the way from dentistry to medicine to allied health, like I said. And you see dentists and orthodontists are listed on here. So we are also very critical components of these teams. So what is clefting? I've talked a lot about what a cleft and craniofacial team is, but we're gonna talk about what cleft uh, actually is. So. Clefting happens when there's a failure of fusion of two or more things in your utero. It just They just don't fuse for one reason or another. Now, Tessier clefts are something different. So when I say cleft, that's a very, very broad term. So you might have heard of cleft lip, cleft palate, something like that. And so if you say cleft to me, it opens a whole list in my mind of what cleft you're talking about. Whereas maybe you're thinking the only cleft that exists is a cleft lip and cleft palate. But as you'll see, there's a lot of different types of clefts. So Tessier clefts you see in this image on the right, clefts can involve soft tissue and bone and extend from the face all the way up to the cranium. So those are things called Tessier clefts. Those are very complicated, uh, complicated clefts. Today, we're going to be focusing our discussion on non-syndromic cleft lip and palate, as opposed to Tessier clefts or syndromic cleft lip and palate. So I, again, bring this to your attention so that you recognize that there's a lot of different types of clefts out there. There are a lot of different types, um, and we need to be very deliberate in what exactly, what type of cleft we're describing, because the timing of intervention and the type of intervention is very, very different. So again, today, we're only talking about non-syndromic cleft lip and palate. So this gives you an idea of what an intact palate looks like. You see that on the top, whereas clefting, there are three examples of that in the examples, uh, what, you, what you see on the bottom. So in an intact palate where there's no cleft, you see the primary palate in blue separated from the secondary palate in orange by the incisive foramen. So that really designates the, uh, the boundary of the primary versus secondary palate. Now you might be wondering, well, what's primary palate versus secondary palate in the scheme of things? A cleft of the primary palate involves a cleft lip with or without a cleft alveolus or the ridge that houses the teeth in the maxilla. 
a cleft of the secondary palate is what you see in that middle image on the bottom where the incisive foramen on back is, is cleft. And complete cleft lip and palate, you see here where there's a cleft of the primary palate continuous with a cleft of the secondary palate. Now there's a lot of different types of this beyond what I've shown you here. You can of course have unilateral, which you see, but also bilateral occurring on both sides, um, as well as different versions of what, what you see here. So uh, the point here is showing you that there's primary palate clefts and secondary palate clefts. Again, the, the timing for the intervention on these is very different and the type of intervention is different as well. So the general timelines of intervention and in cleft care depend on a couple of things. One is the patient, uh, because of course everything is patient dependent, as well as the center or the team that you work with, because philosophies can change a little bit. But by and large, I'll give you some general overviews of uh, some things that we are thinking about at certain time points. So NAM stands for nasoalveolar molding. Uh, it's uh, I'll go over that in a couple of slides, but that's something that we typically do in the first week of life anywhere between one week to three to six months of age. Um, this is just showing you the difference between a unilateral cleft lip and palate versus bilateral cleft lip and palate. You can see, I'll point out to you some differences when you have a cleft on one side versus on both sides. So when you have a unilateral cleft lip and palate, which you see here, you see that first the columella, which is that cartilaginous part of the middle of your nose, the underside, is pulled off towards the intact side or the non-cleft side. And additionally, in doing so, it's also flattening the nasal ala of the nose on that cleft side. Now, if you're looking at a bilateral cleft lip and palate, it looks a bit different. You obviously have a cleft on the right and the left, and that separates something called the premaxilla and prolabium. That's what you see here. And the critical part that you have to recognize when you're looking at this is there's an absent columella, that middle part underneath the nose, there's an absent columella in the case of a bilateral condition because you don't have that lip that's tethered or held down by any other part of the lip. So that columella here that in the unilateral case is just pulled off to one side in a bilateral case, it wasn't allowed to develop because the lip wasn't pulled down. So it's absent. Now you might see a premaxilla that's deviated off to the right or the left or something like that. In this case, it's midline, um, but it is something to consider when you're designing your NAM appliance. So another thing that we wanna look at when we're uh, evaluating infants that have a cleft is their alveolar segment alignment. So these are models that we take of infants. So yes, we do take impressions on babies. Um, we can also do intraoral scans sometimes now that we have that technology. Uh, but as you see here, these casts were, were made from infant impressions. And you can see what we call the greater segment here separated by the lesser or se separated from the lesser segment by that alveolar cleft here. And the orientation before on the left versus after NAM treatment on the right is different of that greater segment. So what you see here is the greater segment is sort of looking off and forward before NAM. And then the goal with NAM treatment is to align the alveolar segments into a reasonably oriented alveolar um, uh, shape. And so who would be involved in doing this? Orthodontists if they're trained, pediatric uh, dentists if they're trained, prosthodontists if, if they're trained. Just to give you an, an idea, I did not train on doing this in residency. This is something I trained in my hospital fellowship. So what's the primary purpose of nasoalveolar molding or NAM treatment? This is what I mean when I'm talking about that appliance, the NAM appliance. It's an acrylic, um, a liner in some ways, if you want to think about it that way, it's, it's a plate that we make off of those impressions and casts that we make from the, from the baby. And what we're doing is progressively over the course of weeks to months, molding the alveolus to that desired align alveolar shape. And we use denture reline material. You can see that light pink here. 
Also, uh, we add this thing called a nasal stent when I was showing you before that the nose is flattened in a unilateral case or there's uh, missing columella of the nose in the bilateral case, we're stretching that tissue over time using an appliance like this. So the purpose of NAM is uh, primarily uh, letter B on here to align the alveolar segments and develop the nasal structure in these babies. I say plus minus feeding because babies may feed better with this in place, they may not. Um, it's that's not the primary reason you would be doing this. And also plus minus protection of oral versus nasal cavities. Oh, it does uh, offer some protection, but it does, but it also does, I mean, it's sort of a wash. The primary reason you would be doing a NAM appliance is to align the alveolar segments and develop the nasal structure. Now what's next? Lip repair uh, ha happens between three to six months of age and palate repair. 12 to 15 months of age, those are of course happening with our plastic surgeon or oral surgeon friends. Um, secondary palate repair and speech surgery also happens around three years of age. So you can see there's a lot of surgeries that these kids go through even before they make it to the traditional orthodontic age, which is anywhere between six to nine years of age. So there's a lot that they that they go through, but we as cleft and craniofacial orthodontists are heavily involved in the first a few weeks to a few months of life. Uh, and then we take a little bit of a back seat until childhood years when we're starting to think about timing for bone grafting. So what is bone grafting? So when you have a cleft of the alveolus, that means what you see here on this image, you're missing bone where teeth otherwise would be or at least teeth otherwise would be erupting. So we wanna fill that gap with bone. Typically, surgeons take it from the hip and place it, and we tell patients they place it in the gum, but they really flap the gum and then put it in the bone to fill that to fill that defect. And assuming it's a successful graft, I say assuming because not all grafts are successful, and that's something important to remember, but assuming it's a successful graft, then it creates a union between that lesser segment here and the greater segment here. Um, so that you you eliminate that cleft of the alveolus. Now, it's important to also remember that we're providing bony stock for eruption, eruption of the permanent teeth. So this is happening anywhere between six to nine years of age before permanent teeth in that area start to come in. It's not to allow eruption of the permanent teeth, though. I think that's a little bit of a misconception. Well, some people say you need bone there for teeth to erupt. Teeth will erupt regardless of bone being there. What you need bone there for is to allow them to erupt through intact bone. And that's the important part. It also provides bony continuity of the alveolar segments, like I mentioned, and then provides bony support to the nasal floor and alar base. So when you have a cleft, you're missing bone and on that side. So including right underneath the nose. So adding bone graft will then support that, that side of the nose. It's also not uncommon following a bone graft to know that the, the uh, floor of the nose on that cleft side is lower than the floor of the nose on the non-cleft side. So when you're looking at images like that, you do typically still see some asymmetry even despite a successful graft. Also closing any oral nasal fistula. So what I mean by this is when you have a soft uh, tissue defect, so Let's say there's still a, a hole in the roof of the mouth um, in the area of the alveolar cleft. Water, food, whatever it is, can pass from the mouth to the nose very readily. So the goal would be to also close any remaining small defects in that area at the time of the bone graft. Sometimes they need to be separated into a different procedure depending on the location of the fistula or the size of it. But by and large, the goal would be to try to, to try to close it at the time of the graft. So how would you look for an alveolar cleft? Uh, how would you even know it exists in the first place? There are 2D and 3D methods to doing this. Uh, there's a misconception that 3D is the only way you can do this. And while it's a helpful way, there are still very effective two-dimensional ways to do this as well, as long as you're selecting the right images. Uh, it's sort of beyond the scope of our time together today to learn how to do this specifically. But if you want to learn more about how to do this, uh, we published the first cleft reporting template 
uh, in the cleft palate and craniofacial journal a couple of years ago. So you're welcome to find this and, and read through it. Um, and also, if you are interested in taking a course now or in the future, we also offer a first of its kind course in cleft diagnosis, focusing specifically on the radiography. So this is critically important because it's very, very easy to do this wrong and not even realize it. So alveolar segment collapse, um, when we're talking about pre-bone graft orthodontic treatment that we might be providing in preparation for a bone graft, is usually to address this. So when we do NAM treatment in infancy, we're aligning the alveolar segments. You saw that example that I showed you when we're giving the plate to the babies. We we usually get good alignment of the alveolar segments in the arch at that time. Now, six, seven, eight years pass until patients come in and see us again, let's say, and then their arch looks like this. And you can see that there's a collapse here. So the greater segment here overlaps in the anterior aspect with the lesser segment here. So the reason for that is when you have a complete cleft, you're missing that midline support. So the cleft runs from the lip through the alveolar segment here, and then all the way through the secondary palate. This is what a scar looks like from a, from a cleft palate repair, the one that happens around one year of age. So that's what that looks like. But when we're preparing for a bone graft, if we do pre-bone graft orthodontic treatment, it's not uncommon to do some degree of expansion. Now, if you're interested in reading some more about different types of treatments that are that are at least reported to be provided, we surveyed some teams and this is a, a great article that you can look at too. Um, this is where we're looking to align the alveolar segments. So we do that with something called a fan expander, sometimes a quad helix or a W arch. Those are also different types of expanders we have at our disposal in orthodontics. But what you see here is a fan expander. It differentially expands in the anterior versus the posterior to get you a well-aligned arch like what you see here. Now, if you've had an expander in the past as a patient in an orthodontic practice, you likely did not have this expander. You likely had a traditional expander or a Hyrax expander, which is addressing posterior crossbite to make your top jaw wider. That's different and with a different goal than this type of expander, which is again, a fan expander and it expands more in the anterior than the posterior. So just because we say we're using, using an expander doesn't mean it's the same expander or with the same purpose as you would in a patient who doesn't have a cleft. Now, what additional prosthetics might we be providing for patients with clefts? So velopharyngeal insufficiency or incompetence, abbreviated as VPI, is a speech, it's in the speech world. So speech language pathologists diagnose this. We do not diagnose this. But if you're trained in doing this, uh, at least in providing this service, you might be working with speech pathologists as part of your appointments. Now, not everybody in cleft and craniofacial care is trained in making speech obturators. I am because of the fellowship that I went to, but it's not taught in every fellowship either. So it's not necessarily a service that you would expect to find in every team. But to give you an idea of what it's for, there are some reasons why you would use an appliance called a lift, which is the one on the bottom here, versus a bulb, which is on the top here. When you have a condition, so if it's neuromuscular, for instance, where your soft palate, um, which is responsible for lifting and lowering to close off air from escaping through your nose as you speak, if your soft palate doesn't function correctly, let's say it's it doesn't have a lot of muscle tone and it's just soft, it can't lift itself. So sometimes what we'll do is create a lift appliance to give that uh, soft palate some height. And what you see is that appliance down here. Now, if it's, if you have a different case where like in the, in the, in the case of a cleft, for instance, even with a successful cleft palate repair, where they reorient the muscles in surgery, the function of those muscles may not be optimal. So that's also affecting your soft palate as well as your, the walls of your oral pharynx. 
and constricting to be able to similarly block air from exiting through your nose when it should really be going through your mouth when you're trying to make certain speech sounds. Um, so in that case, we make something called a bulb, which you see here, uh, and that basically sits within the pharynx. And uh, when patients are in function, when people are speaking and in function, it basically plugs that hole so that the, the muscles, because they weren't able to touch, uh, the walls weren't able to touch before, now they touch the bulb. So um, these are really unique appliances, again, that not everyone is trained in providing, but they can be tremendously valuable um, for patients who are not candidates for that speech surgery that I referenced earlier. Now, lastly here, comprehensive orthodontics and preparation for jaw surgery is something that we're likely involved in uh, as patients age. So that's in the late teens to early adulthood for traditional jaw surgery. Uh, we wait till patients are done growing. Now, if we're going to be doing something called distraction osteogenesis, which I'll show you on the coming slides, that can be done sometimes before a patient is done growing, and we do it for slightly different reasons. So this is an example of a case where the axilla was very far back and needed to be advanced forward. So what you see here is you see how that maxilla is very uh, far back compared to the mandible. This is called a lateral cephalogram. It's a common image we use in orthodontics where you look at the from the side of the head to see the front frontal and vertical relationships of the jaws relative to each other and relative to the rest of the head. But what you see here is a petite maxilla. It's positioned back with actually a very normal sized mandible and normally positioned mandible. Um, now, the reason why you see a maxilla like that is maxillas may have restricted growth because of cleft repairs. Uh, so you do tend to see a class three or an underbite develop over time. Now, if there's not a tremendous discrepancy uh, and it's still beyond the range of what orthodontics could correct, then traditional jaw surgery may be, may be indicated where you could advance that maxilla, let's say, and you still have good solid bone to bone contact where you can get a stable placement of the maxilla with that single movement. But you see here that this is this maxilla is quite far back. So to do a single movement and move that maxilla forward in one procedure um, can, can be a bit limiting in terms of what, what bony structures you have to, to sit the, the structures against. So in that case, we might consider something called distraction osteogenesis, where you still go through a surgery, um, but we progressively advance the maxilla over the come or the following weeks. And that should be laying down bone behind the maxilla and let it essentially grow in some ways uh, over the next few weeks to position it forward. And you see that here, this is a few weeks later where the maxilla is being advanced forward. This is connected to something called a halo appliance that is attached to the, to the skull. Um, and then the maxilla is now in its final position. This doesn't necessarily mean that patients won't need a definitive traditional jaw surgery in the future but it at least establishes somewhat more of a reasonable position to that maxilla before going in and doing any additional jaw surgery if it's needed. So this is just an overlay of what you can see uh, before versus after uh, distraction. So in summary, I know we talked about a lot, but team care is critical for the comprehensive needs of these patients. So any patient with a cleft or craniofacial difference is really, really benefited by being seen by a cleft and craniofacial team. Birth to adulthood is the age range that we see them. So whichever member of the team you are, birth to adulthood. But again, I think what makes craniofacial orthodontists different in their practice population than traditional orthodontists is that we see babies uh, that's not typical of a traditional orthodontic practice. Craniofacial orthodontics, as I mentioned, again, plus minus fellowship training. I highly advocate for fellowship training. 
uh, which is training beyond residency. Um, and I believe that by the time you would make it to this, this stage in making the decision, you likely would have to be doing a fellowship, just if I have to predict the future. Um, so that's it. But I just wanted to announce uh, we have a course coming up this Sunday. We're closing registration for it tomorrow evening. Uh, it's on optimizing your professional online presence for students applying to dental school and residency. So if you are interested in that and you're planning to either apply this cycle or perhaps next cycle, I think this is a good um, mini course that, that we'll be doing. It's a condensed version of our bigger course that we offer in this. But the goal being that how you should be using your social media, how you can use that to perhaps help your professional online presence, as well as some free tools that you can use to do that. So if you're interested in, in signing up for that, you can scan that QR code there and we'll be closing registration tomorrow evening with the, with the course being taught live on Sunday morning. But that's it. Thank you guys so much. This has been fun. I would welcome any of your questions. Um, again, if you want to follow us on Bite Size uh, Instagram, you can scan the pink QR code there. If you want to get links um, and emailed resources in the future, scan the blue QR code and we'll be happy to keep in touch. But thank you guys. Thank you, Dr. Preston. So now at this time, we can open up to a Q&A session. So if any of you guys do have any questions, please go ahead and type them in, or you guys can also just unmute yourselves and go in and ask. And I'll be reading off the questions from the chat if you guys do decide to upload me. Hi. Hi, Dr. Hi. Preston. Uh, I want to say thank you for your time. I just had a very um, specific question to like your experience in dental school. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, like, how often were you exposed in your dental school to like cranial facial topics and ortho and like what really led you to want to dive into orthodontics specifically in clefts? It's a great question that you ask. And I think it's a little different now for dental students, perhaps than it was when I was a dental student um, in that. So when I went back to, well, I'll start with, I'll first answer your question about when I discovered cleft and craniofacial care. I didn't really discover this until I was a resident. So we didn't really have much exposure in dental school. Um, and then in residency, we shadowed. And now there's some degree of, of patient care that's integrated into residency programs. But I really liked the model of working in a hospital, um, which again, you don't have to work in a hospital, even if you treat patients with clefts and craniofacial differences. But I knew I wanted my patient population to be exclusively that. And so it made sense for me to do a fellowship. So I learned about the option of fellowships during my rotation as a resident. Now, in saying that, I did not immediately go and do a fellowship. I was out for a couple of years before going back and doing a fellowship. So even still, it's not something that you have to decide upon as you're finishing up residency. You may feel it's something, you know, you want to try on regular practice or private practice for size before deciding on that route. And that's also completely fine. Now, in dental school now, the reason why I contrast that with my experience as a dental student is because when I, I moved back to Los Angeles again <laughs> and became the pre-doc program director there, they had established over the time that, that I was out a cleft and craniofacial study club, which was a dental student study club. So that was something that existed that, that didn't exist when I was a dental student. Now, I think it's good in that it gives you some didactic exposure to those topics. The more you can get, the better, you know, it, um, but it's not treating patients. And similarly, even in residency, you might treat some patients, but I think that there's a real need in residency to have a standardized education in it. And that's something that's actually an area of mine that I'm looking to develop. And I speak on it a lot that we have an absence of consensus and standard of care in some of these aspects of cleft and craniofacial care. So that also then makes it diff difficult to teach in a program if there's no um, 
regimented curriculum for it. So there are programs out there for residency that do incorporate this somewhat into their, well, every every program incorporates it. It's just that whether or not you treat patients with clefts and craniofacial differences um, depends on the program. But even still, um, I would be very hesitant in saying that that's, um, that's enough if you want to be having this be your primary practice population. In that case, I would say if you want this to be a primary practice population, it, it really is beneficial to go ahead and do a fellowship. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I like it made me realize like I'd have to go out of my way in dental school to kind of like join those specific groups and to like actually um, like get myself more experienced in that area. It's like not more so implemented in the courses and like in and like labs. I have to like find my own group. Yeah. And you learn about this stuff in in bits and pieces in dental school, like right. you learn about different syndromes and perhaps the the development of those of those conditions. Or you you learn in em embryology like how a cleft develops. But in terms of treating these yeah. conditions or the clinical applications, that you might learn some of that more so in residency. But again, even still in residency, it is somewhat limited. And it's not to rag on residencies. I mean, residencies are great. I you you need to to be an orthodontist. You have to go to residency, obviously. But there's also there's so much to learn in traditional orthodontics as it is to wrap that into most programs now are three years. So wrap that into three years, and then also master cleft and craniofacial care is is a little too much. So I think. It's great and very important that residencies still continue to integrate cleft and craniofacial care and exposure to that while in residency, because a lot of patients don't live within a very close distance to a large uh, cleft team or center. So we do rely on providers in small towns to be able to provide some of these care or some of this care. Otherwise, patients have to travel hours and hours and hours to get to their monthly appointments. So I think it's really important that that residencies continue to teach this to whatever extent they do in right. residency. But if it's something that you're looking at, you know, like what I did, for instance, which is like have hospital-based practice or be more exclusively committed to this population, that's when I'd say a fellowship is where you want to go. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for answering the question. Yeah, you're welcome. Great question. <laughs> It's a journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, this is actually, I've always, I was more interested in oral surgery and I wasn't, I wasn't very familiar with like orthodontics, like implementation in craniofacial. So that's, that's really interesting to learn. So thank you. Awesome. Well, you're welcome to, to message anytime if you have questions that come up in the meanwhile. Perfect. Any other questions? All right. All right, Dr. Preston, thank you so much for this informative presentation today. It does seem like we don't have any more questions. So that being said, the post quiz will be uploaded after this session and you guys can go ahead and take that whenever that's done. All right. Thank you so thank much. You Dr. Guys. Bye. <laughs>